Welcome back to part two of our overview of the Russian Civil War. Last time we were taking a look at the Red Army, having a think about how, when it was uh, developed, who it consisted of. And we took a look at the idea that conscription had been introduced. And yet, yeah, there's a high rate of desertion. So how did the Red Army try to keep its numbers together? It did, in fact, despite earlier reforms to try to do away with discipline and ranks, it realised the need for them and so brought them back in 1918. So ranks and salutes returned and there was punishment by death for desertion or disloyalty. And not only death for the uh, member of the Red Army himself, but also reprisals against families. That is, you go ahead and do the wrong thing, we will not only kill you, but we will track down your family and kill them as well. So fairly tight um, and strict discipline imposed in order to try to keep as many together in the Red Army. The other really important thing to understand about the Red Army is the use of political commissars. Okay, so these are guys who are not military, they are not a part of the Red Army. They are, basically, very dedicated Bolshevik Party members. One of these is attached to each Red Army unit, and they are monitoring the activities and the decisions that are being made by the military commanders. This is one way that they were able to keep some of those previous um, Tsarist officers under control. Basically no military order could be carried out unless it was also signed by a political commissar. This is a really significant way that the Bolshevik party maintained control and discipline over the ranks because often it wasn't necessarily the military commander that would do the um, punishments but it would be the political commissar that would ensure that those punishments for desertion and disloyalty were carried through. Here's just some photos for you to um, get a, a view of some of our Red Army people. And you've got to understand, even though we've studied World War I and the modern warfare, what we're doing in the Russian Civil War is taking a step back in terms of technological warfare. And the cavalry, this is a war of movement. It rages back and forth across Russia, and therefore the cavalry play a significant role. Also, uh, our Red Army infantry, seen down at the bottom there, probably singing a song as they walk along. Here they look in pretty good nick, but at, at certain times the Red Army uniforms were very much lacking. Uh, boots, for example, uh, were not always available to all Red Army members. You can imagine what that would have been like in a Russian winter. So things were hard in the Red Army. As the war goes on, of course, they need new recruits. And here we see a Red Army unit from Turkmenistan, which is one of the Asian provinces that uh, Russia was seeking to control. If you have a look at these, especially some of these guys down the front here, you can see that they're very young, very young. Many of these recruits are orphans. Uh, and uh, you can see the train here that has come is basically recruiting and picking up uh, new Red Army members. Um, the Red Army weren't the only ones who had young recruits. Things got desperate. An important aspect, however, of the Red Army and the way that it operated is the train network. I've already shown you a picture of some of the trains. Here you can see an armoured train which could actually, you know, go through uh, opposition territory and take uh, men and ammunition deep uh, behind the white lines. And if you think about the map I showed you earlier on, the fact that the Reds were centralised in the middle of Russia enabled them to take, uh, take control of the railway networks and use it for their logistical benefit. The whites, of course, were on 
uh, different sides at different times, sometimes had access to railways, sometimes did not. So the control of the railways ended up being quite crucial in the movement of troops and supplies for the Reds. And Trotsky, who's Minister for War, uh, did have a number of strategies that centred on defending lines of transport and communication in order to maintain that vital logistical control, which in the long term did support the Reds and enabled them to win the Civil War. Here's just one of our Red Generals, probably the key one whose name you might see as you're reading about the Civil War, as General Tukhachevsky. Uh, he was a very able, very capable Red General, uh, and certainly when the Poles started to invade in 1920, he led the counter-offensive that stopped the Poles from coming forward and uh, you know, really started to push them back. Tukhachevsky was a uh, well-known Bolshevik and did hold significant posts um, in the communist government after the war, but like many other key Bolsheviks of the time, he became a victim of Stalin's purges in January 1937, something that we'll learn a lot more about as we move forward into the Stalinist era. But what about our whites? Let's take a look at some of our key white generals so that you're familiar with the names. This name, of course, you've already know, General Kornilov. Okay, and here he is. And he is actually one of the first generals that started the white army, that started a counter-revolution against the Bolsheviks and helped to form the white army. And certainly he was operating down in the south, in the Caucasus region. Uh, that's where he started gathering troops, uh, former white, off, um, sorry, former Tsarist army troops who wanted to fight back against the Bolsheviks. And so he, particularly around here in the, the town of Rostov, is where he starts to gather them together and form the beginnings of what is our white army. It is, of course, a volunteer army. It's not conscripted. It includes Cossacks who are based in that region there in the south. It includes cadets, uh, remember, those who are constitutional monarchists. It also includes Tsarists, those who'd like to see the Tsar return. The Tsar is still alive at this stage, of course, in late 1917, early 1918. Unfortunately, however, for Kornilov, he led some early attacks in April 1918 down here in the south of Russia. Um, and was killed in action. And the Whites uh, buried him. And when the Reds came and took control of the town, they actually dug up his rotting body and paraded it through the town and then burnt it. The Reds obviously didn't think a lot of General Kornilov. Replacing Kornilov is a guy called General Denikin, who is there for quite some time, again based in the south, um, in this region down here. And he is in control from, um, say, April 1918 through until uh, April 1920. He's quite successful in leading the white forces in this area of southern Russia. Uh, and as you can see, at a certain point in 1919 is able to get quite close to Russia, uh, to Moscow, sorry. He got tired and resigned in April 1920, having really been pushed back significantly by that stage. But another key white army general is Admiral Kolchak, okay, the bald one. And now he is in a different area. He is over on this side, on the east. And he is basically taking control of Western Siberia and then moving in, in this direction um, to push against the Reds. In fact, he basically declares a whole new state over in Western Siberia, uh, which are intended to rebel against the Red Bolsheviks. Certainly by early 1919, he's in charge of the White Army in this area 
and with the support of some Czech troops, which I'll talk about in a moment, led a major offensive against the Reds in early 1919. But by June 1919, he was on the back foot. Okay, so while he gets quite significantly close over the Ural Mountains, um, unfortunately, uh, he's pushed back, unfortunately for him, and in 1920, he's actually captured by Bolsheviks and executed. And that is the end of the White Army resistance from that corner. Over in the West, we have General Yudinich, who uh, is based in the state of Estonia, and again, basically declares himself this little uh, state supported by the Allies. And... Um, supported particularly by the British and again he is pushing in so he's over in this area here and he's pushing in and you can see he gets almost on the outskirts of Petrograd there but Trotsky races across from Moscow okay and rallies the troops and is able to push Yudinich and his forces back now, they got stuck up in this area here and had to be evacuated by the British by sea. So the Reds were able to hang on yet again. Which leaves us with one final general to take a look at, General Baron Wrangel, sometimes known as the Black Baron. And he was operating down in the south after Dunekin resigned. Uh, resigned. Really, he's not leading any significant uh, attack against the Reds, rather he's overseeing the defeat of the Whites and eventually they are pushed back to the Crimea here and evacuated by Allied ships. That's our White Generals. You can see here a Bolshevik cartoon and we've got Dnikin, Kolchak and Yudinich and they're like dogs, ravenous, slithering dogs but have a look at who they're under the control of okay you probably recognize this guy uncle sam from america but we've also got the british and the french um, in existence over here they're controlling the reins these are the allies who have um, intervened in the civil war and have a think about what this piece of propaganda is saying it is giving out a very strong message that the white generals are mere dogs being led by the allies they are not really looking for the best interests of russia but are instead being led by the allies which leads us to take a look at some of the white army troops um, who uh, many of them we would say that they were certainly top heavy um, a lot more officers than you would normally find you can understand that given who they are recruiting more conservative members of Russian society uh, but also large numbers of peasants well some peasants from the regions that they were in Certainly a large number of Cossacks joined the White Army, at least to begin with, and uh, they are based in that area down in the south of Russia. And just like we saw with our Red Army, we do have very young recruits. As time goes on, they're getting very low. And here's a picture of some Finnish young men, very young joining the war effort on behalf of the White Army. We might leave it there and the next part I'll look at some of the others that are involved as well as the Reds and the Whites.